All right, everyone, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for showing up for Grand Rounds today. We have Dr. Schwab uh, from the Department of Geriatrics who will be talking to us uh, about chronic illness. So I'll give a little bit of introduction to Dr. Schwab. So Dr. William Schwab uh, joined University Hospital's Case Western U uh, Reserve University as an associate professor in geriatrics and palliative care with secondary appointment in neurology and director of house call programs in 2016. Prior to joining University Hospitals, Dr. Schwab was a chief geriatrics uh, Chief of Geriatrics for Ohio Permanente Medical Group. Dr. Schwab completed his undergraduate degree in Fine Arts at the School of Visual Arts in New York, followed by his postgraduate training at Columbia University. Following that, he pursued his medical uh, degree and PhD at Washington University in St. Louis. There he completed his PhD thesis on determinants of the me uh, mechanical properties of fibroblasts. He did his internal medicine training and geriatric fellowship at Barnes Jewish Hospital at Washington University in St. Louis as well. Dr. Schwab has held numerous leadership positions during his career so far and remains an active member of several geriatric professional societies. He remains dedicated to training the next generation of physicians here at UH. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Schwab. Thank you very much and thank you for attending and uh, thanks for your patience and uh, let's see if we can have a little bit of fun. So, uh -oh. okay, I, my, I think my uh, PhD thesis has the uh, uh, distinction of being the thesis with the least clinical relevance of anything done at WashU over that decade. Uh, and as such, I don't know that I'm going to give anyone here anything which is directly clinically relevant on a day-to-day -day basis, but I'm going to try and present a way of thinking about illness, both acute and chronic. Uh, if we are going to design rational structures of care, we need to know what we are designing structures on. Uh, so I don't know if anybody can, if everybody can read this, but uh, anyone who's had me as an attending has had me talk about uh, Dr. Kuhn's book on the structure of scientific revolutions. And the whole book is basically about the transitions. Can people read this? Because I, I call it PowerPoint syndrome when someone in front reads out a slide word for word because it contains within it the basic assumption that your audience is illiterate. I think most of you are literate. Uh, so specifically, this sentence, and I'm hopeful that I've organized the talk uh, with his conclusion. I'm hopeful at the end of this that these questions will have been addressed, including number five. It's impossible to know where you are with knowing, without knowing where you came from. And the medical tradition, and it really is a tradition, goes back well over 2,500 years. It originated with two basic strains, which is the Hippocratic strain and the Esculapian strain. Uh, one involved the idea of illness particular to self or what we would call patient-centered care. Uh, another involved illness that could be treated by outside factors, either to replace what was in or to fix something without. It also should be noted that Aesculapius, although he was a god and the son of Apollo, was actually killed by Zeus for charging uh, or counting up what he did with RVUs. So uh, we should realize something, that we're, we're relatively recent. The humoral tradition went on for well over 2,000 years. Uh, modern medicine, what we would call recognizable medicine, something which really only came in after the French Revolution uh, in Europe, uh, in France, and Germany. Uh, this means that for 2,000 years, people had case reports, people had medical schools, people looked and said, you know, I saw this person over there, I gave them a purgative and uh, made them, uh, yeah, and some laxative, and now they're back to themselves because I've readjusted uh, the various humors. Uh, the, you could have two people with similar symptoms, but for different reasons, because the roots of disease are particular to the individual. Uh, it still influences the way we talk. Uh, and Occam, uh, and I think all of you have encountered Occam's razor, Occam himself was a radical nominalist, which means that he did not believe in things as categories, he believed in things as particulars. And that's one of the rationales of the Occamian razor is that to keep them from putting things into a category which they should not be put into. 
but in many ways, this was the ultimate inpatient center. The hospital, which is where we all live now, actually were usually religious and charitable institutions which served two functions, both to provide charity and kindness to the ill as well as quarantine. And there was a concept of quarantine of illness related to the miasmal theories, but the concept of quarantine to the patients. Um, really at the time of the 19th century, beginning in the, after about the first quarter of the 19th century and onward, there was a number of events beginning in the 16th century which led to the idea of a scientific medicine. I, now, one of the effects of this is that we started to move from treating the patient per se to treating a diagnosis. Uh, in America, and specifically a case, this transition to a scientific medicine is something for which Case Western was particularly praised for. It was mentioned specifically in the Flexor Report as one of the paradigms for a modern hospital along with Hopkins and a few others, Duke. Nothing I say today should be taken as a criticism of the idea of, uh, of scientific medicine. I have a history of being uh, on evidence-based medicine leadership for a large organization and things like that. However, we need to know that where it comes from and what its limits are. Now, for all of the advances in medicine, we really have not changed the maximum lifespan. The estimate from the anthropologist of the Ramsey II lived into the 10th decade. And one of the things that when you look and you see that the average life expectancy in the, uh, during the Dark Ages was about 33, 35 years, one of the things that you have to remember is that when you take average life expectancy, this uh, part of this is dependent on uh, the total, you know, how many ages you study. For instance, in most countries, uh, the equatorial countries, places like this, if you subtract out everybody above five, you change the average lifespan by 20 years. I, now, with the transition of a civilization, the, prime, the predominant causes of death will change. In pre-agricultural times, the predominant cause of death was trauma, uh, either inflicted during work hunting or during war, until the invention of agriculture. And agriculture created a system where you had excess food, you had enough food that you could support people who were not actively involved in gathering and creating food. This now led to the creation and the magnification of cities. Uh, actually, in the 14th century prior to the plague, the population of Europe was equivalent to the population of Europe in the 19th century, only without sewers. So uh, with this close contact, you had the opportunity for the spread of contagion, and you also had the opportunity for sewage-related problems. Uh, trauma never went away. However, probably the greatest advance in the average lifespan of the human uh, in the last 400 years actually is building the sewers. Uh, this led to one of the... Uh, uh, one of the greatest works of epidemiology ever done, which is John Snow. Uh, this is not the winter is coming, John Snow. This is a different John Snow. This is 1854. Yes, before Netflix. Okay. Uh, John Snow isolated the, a cholera spread in the Soho neighborhood in 1854 down to one particular pump on Broad Street. Uh, now, this is for Dr. Slot and Dr. Armitage, but. I don't know if I would want a uh, monument to my life on this earth to be a cholera-infected water pump, but <laughs> it's probably better than I'm going to get <laughs> anyway. So Now, there's a concatenation of a number of different things going on right now. There's Dr. Snow and there's Louis Pasteur, who has managed to show that there's some sort of invisible, communicable thing which is able to cause putrefaction, or if removed, then not. You have Dr. Lister showing that carbolic acid should, reduces the rates of wound gangrene and things like that. How? It's a mystery, but this is, we're starting to see a removal of the ill to the hospital, not just for isolation, but for treatment. Uh, you see the germ theory now beginning to replace the miasma theory. Any of us who have talked about medicine, and specifically infectious disease, have actually talked about miasma because the word malaria simply means bad air. 
because it was not transmitted by mosquitoes. It was transmitted by bad, swampy, icky air. Alexander Fleming came along, and in 1928, a drug which is very active against staphylococci, imagine that, uh, named penicillin was discovered. Uh, this is also contemporaneous with a number of different things, which is housing was improving, nutrition was improving, sewage was improving. All of these led to both a healthier host as well as when the host becomes unhealthy, more things that we could do for it. But the great cause of this was this was the scientific, the sterile, the white coat and such like that approach to medicine. Uh, and we spend more and more time talking about diagnoses and the skill of the doctor is to try and find the diagnosis and therefore treat it. Remember Koch's postulates, uh, sufficient and necessary. I, and specialties began to organize into, uh, at, sorry, Specialties began to organize into organ-related groups, such as geriatrics. Well, maybe not geriatrics, uh, such as cardiology. <laughs> I, is there anyone who looks at this picture and doesn't think Parkinson's disease? But, <laughs> now the, this really is the father of chronic illness. Dr. Fleming actually uh, did many, many plates of his penicillium and he would give them out as presents. This is the one which was actually sent to the queen. So. And the effect of, as we've seen, to go back a bit, the creation of cities and civilization and large groups of people have led to an immense importance in infectious disease as a cause of death. And now we've got a treatment, even kill staphylococci. Uh, now, as many of you know, I hope, Sulfa drugs actually came first. But what I would really look at on this slide <coughs> is Star Wars. Okay. Uh, oops. I would do bad with a lightsaber. Here's penicillin. Look at what's going on prior to the penicillin. Is that I'm making this up right now, but I would describe this to the other factors such as cleanliness uh, and nutrition and improving uh, the sewage system. But you can see that uh, we are going down from 65 to 12 per thousand, uh, I'm sorry, 100,000 deaths. And for those of you who do not have binoculars, this is infectious disease, and that's infectious disease between 1900 and 2010. This is what the Department of Infectious Disease has done. <coughs> we have radically changed. Now, one of the points, and I will make this again, is that if you look at heart disease, it seems like heart disease and cancer have gotten worse. We are not, uh, we are not increasing the amount of cancer and heart disease per se. Uh, one of the rules of this earth is that nobody gets out of here alive. And if you're not going to die of pneumonia, which Dr. Osler, one of my cult heroes, uh, which Dr. Osler referred to as the friend of the elderly, um, he also said, when I see a patient with arthritis coming in my front door, I try and leave out my back door. Well, I do have an interest in geriatric pain, which Dr. Osler apparently did not share. Uh, however, the, uh, you know, you, in the end, you die of something. Uh, and we can see that tuberculosis and flu peak at 19, in the year 1900. Cardiac, for those of you who interest, is, are interested in the history of medicine, you see, cardiac disease peaks in 1960. Uh, one of the great discussions, if I asked anyone in this room what causes an acute MI, I'm hopeful many of you would start telling me about clots in the coronary arteries. Have you ever thought about the fact that when someone hits the autopsy room, people have clot in every artery? How did they know that the uh, coronary arteries? And this was something of much debate. And as I recall, it's in the mid-1960s. And it's a fascinating story and it has led to the use of aspirin, it has led to the use of catheterization, it has led to the use of lytic, and it has saved thousands, if not millions, of lives. But you see the peak there. Cancer now peaks in 1990. Okay. There was an essay that I read a number of years ago by Ernst Grunberg 
called The Failures of Success, and it really is about the antibiotic era. And he quotes Osler, and since you can read it, I shan't, but what Dr. Grimberg talked about in the essay is that with the advent of the antibiotic era, that we were now going to see an increase in the uh, rates of heart disease and of cancer itself. It's, from my area of interest, what he did not talk about that much was the increase of frailty, the increase in dependency, and the increase of, well, he did talk about chronic illness, but not in the, quite the way I'm going to. So at some point, many of you took a Plato to NATO philosophy course, and uh, as you remember, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. But what will happen is when you do solve the solvable, when you do when uh, my great aunt, Olashalem, had two of her children die in their teens of scarlet fever. Um, I don't know that anyone here, uh, Keith, Dr. Slot, has ever seen anyone die of scarlet fever. But this is not uncommon. Uh, and this does not happen anymore. The so what we have seen is the things which can't be cured by antibiotics. And now, more recently, uh, I basically started in medicine around the time of 1981, and I was in New York City. Actually, when uh, I, my art degree is in photography, and I was a commercial photographer, and I was in New York when AIDS hit. And all of a sudden, and I was in the artistic community when AIDS hit. So uh, you have things, even infectious disease now is confronted with incurable, at least at that time, it still isn't curable, it can be treated now. Uh, with a, suddenly infectious disease was hit by the incurable. Um, now a lot of, this is going to have effects on the structure of care. And one of the rules of structure of care is that 80% of your problems come from 20% of your patients. And actually it comes out very close to it, is that 4% will then cost 64%. And you can see that this is not bad in terms of estimating Medicare costs. A uh, certain major HMO, which I used to work for, 1% of the patients was 25% of the costs. Now, the function of this and the function of this talk is not necessarily to save money, but oftentimes resor resource consumption comes in two different flavors. I mean, I don't know how many people have been following the editorials of the New England Journal about high need, high cost patients, but this is a part of your future. I only have a limited amount more time left in the system, but all of you are going to be dealing with this. And roughly, 50% of the people who use a great deal of resource are people who are supposed to use a great deal of resource. If you just had a bone marrow transplant, you're supposed to be very expensive. That's part of the deal you made with the system, is that you will take care of me. Uh, another 50% are people that everyone has met where they have chronic illnesses, but for whatever reason, there is not success in dealing with those. <coughs> But one of the things to notice is that this cadre of the chronically ill is not a symptom of failure. This is a symptom of success. One of the things that I dislike intensely is when people talk, start talking about the tsunami of chronic illness or the volcano of the elderly or other metaphors. Cyclones and such like that are destructive things. When we start talking about people who are this cadre of the chronically ill, these are people who would have 20 years ago have been dead. And they are currently spending time with children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Uh, when we have surveyed, and we surveyed extensively, the vast majority of people with chronic illness in the mid-80% rate their lives, their quality of life is good. A significant fraction who rate their quality of life do rate their quality of life as bad, but they are oftentimes the ones who we all meet while we're wearing white coats, except for the fact I never wear a white coat. But were I to wear a white coat, I'd meet them. Uh, and these are the people who wind up in the hospital. This is one of the factors which does put them in the hospital. So we need to find treatments that will enable them to achieve their goals within the system. Okay. Remember question five? This is supposed to help. Okay. So, actually, the first question of the talk that I have in preparation 
Uh, it's going to be given at the VA in April, and if you all want, I'd be glad to give here as well. But what is an illness? We're only going to deal with this in terms of trying to define the difference between acute illness and chronic illness. And you can't really do that with Koch's postulates, but I would offer some of my own and some which can be found in various places. If you take a look at acute illness, which is by and large what you see in a hospital, uh, the skill of the practitioner in diagnosis and treatment is critical. And the patient, especially in surgery, in, in surgery the patient is supposed to be comatose. Uh, this, the patient is a passive recipient of medical care. However, there is life outside the hospital, and there is life outside of, a, of an acute illness. The, in chronic illness, when we looked at people with chronic illness who were high resource utilizers, and we went back and chart checked and took a look at medical care, we could see changes in medical care that should be made in the vast minority a very small percentage of the cases. By and large, people received excellent advice. Now, this device was, I, I'm sorry, this advice was not successful, and, but it was not successful for reasons outside of the reality of, outside of the reality of whether or not it was good advice. Many studies have shown that the patient's knowledge and buy-in to their plan, uh, one of Coleman's pil pillars is naming your knowledge of your diagnoses. Uh, that doesn't mean being able to pronounce the word pneumoconiosis. It means knowing that you have a lung disease which can be triggered off into an exacerbation very easily. You have to watch where you're on, you have to watch who you're around and things like that. Uh, not only that, we see, you know, how many times, you know, think of how many times you've seen someone in the hospital without their spouse, without their children. Uh, this comes up in your mind mostly when you're trying to get a history and the person's completely anhistoric. Uh, however, the truth is in chronic illness, exacerbations in dementia, exacerbations in the uh, behavioral symptoms of dementia are oftentimes tied to caregiver stress. In other words, one of the rules of geriatrics for everybody who's been through the rotation is you also have to look at the other people in the room. And in terms of, in terms of chronic illness, so to the caregiver. And in terms of this person who's been admitted four times between April and November, it very likely is at some point during those four admissions, they likely got very good treatment and very good advice. So what needs to be done is a determination of what are the other factors. Now, Another difference is in what defines the success of care. Uh, if someone comes in with a pneumonia, the goal is to cure the pneumonia, or at least stabilize it so that it's improving steadily. Uh, these are objectively defined, and they can be done very easily in terms of systemic review of various parameters. In chronic illness, uh, especially chronic illness with high resource utilization, the definition of a way of life, a modus vivendi. So does, is chronic illness defined by the accumulation and especially high, re, high resource utilization? I'm going to be talking mostly about high resource utilization chronic illness. Is this defined by the number of diagnoses? As you can see, that 15% uh, of the medical, Medicare population is going to have greater than five diagnoses. Uh, hold on, I'm sorry. This will keep doing that until I do this. Okay. So Medicare patients have a lot of diagnoses. But you notice that uh, four out of 10 have multiple diagnoses, but only one out of 10 or one out of eight are the ones which generate the majority of the cost. Uh, one of the things that you notice is that the high cost population are what uh, people you know, define as you know, the Medicare Medicaid, uh, you can call them Medi Medi or the dualies or the people who are dual certified. They're an extremely expensive population. But you notice that that is not a diagnosis, that is not something particular to that person. 
So this is one of the things that this tells you is that the factors that go in to create a situation where there's unsuccessful dealing with chronic illness are factors outside the person themselves. Another thing that I would point out is that for people who have a number of diagnoses, uh, I heard an emergency room doctor one time say that this person who was 95 had a life expectancy of negative 12 years. Um, actually, the life expectancy of a community dwelling 90-year-old is five years. But you notice that even with 10 plus diagnoses, there is a significant reduction in the average lifespan. However, it isn't the day after tomorrow. Some terms which will be useful is monomorbidity. Now, monomorbidity is what you find in the New England Journal of Medicine about nowhere else. When you define what you're doing as an intervention as your RCT, uh, Cynthia Boyd has written very well on this. I would rec for those interested, I would recommend strongly uh, her work. Uh, by and large, the multimorbid patients are excluded. Too many variables. So oftentimes you see the people you know most about are the ones you see least frequently. There are comorbidities, which actually, Dr. Boyd is the one who came up with the term multimorbidity, so she does have pride of ownership. I don't agree with her definition. If someone has a number of distinct, unrelated, even chronic diagnoses, I would not necessarily call that multimorbidity. I would call it comorbidity. What I would define more in terms of multimorbidity is when you have a number of different factors now where the treatment of one interferes with the treatment of the others. And that, to me, is where geriatrics really comes in. And I'll say it twice. I think this is what I just said. Okay. So how do we how do we treat uh, how do we treat multimorbidity, chronic illness, and high resource high, res high resource utilizing chronic illness? I. This is a complex thing. It is not only medical, it is also what we would call non-medical uh, factors uh, play, in, play into the uh, success or non-success. Uh, some years ago, I gave a talk, uh, rounds at UCSF, and I spoke with members of the geriatric department the day before, and one of the members had been tasked with reducing hospital readmission, and she was speaking with a senior member, and uh, he said, we're, we're a medical school. We take care of medical problems. We don't take care of social problems. Actually, UCSF is probably one of the best at taking care of social problems. They've got Tom Bodenheimer, a number of people there. That's absolutely spectacular place. He may have been joking. I don't know. She didn't take it as a joke. Uh, it's If you've got a simple patient, one diagnosis, you can uh, start you can ignore the other things, but the complex, chronic, repeating patient, not really. I, multidisciplinary, you need to look at the caregivers. You need to look at the biopsychosocial milieu. I, many of the things that one deals with, I mean, one of the factors in noncompliance with medication is the cost of the medication. How many of you know how much medications you're giving how many of you given a common thing here, which I really don't understand, but a common thing here is put on lidoderm patches on just about anything, lidoderm patches on chronic low back pain. Uh, how many here know how much lidoderm patches cost over the counter uh, in the pharmacies? Two to three hundred dollars a month. How many know how effective they are on chronic low back pain? Zero. Has no effect. Uh, you can't tell the difference between a placebo patch and a lidoderm patch. Uh, and so what you can wind up doing is you can take your only compliant patient and you're whacking them with 200 bucks a month because insurance will not pay for it unless it's supposed to be a neuralgia. Uh, you're going to wind up uh, take, I've, I've had plenty of patients who are making 1,200 bucks a month on Medicare and uh, you know spending four to 500 on meds. Um, I, there's no reason why you should know what the cost of the meds are, but there should be someone who does. If there's no one else, then it's you. But before you send someone out on medication, how much does it cost? Um, oops, I think I. That, we'll talk more about that. Another thing we have to do is recognize 
how you know, recognize how to find the people who are dealing with uh, chronic illness unsuccessfully. The most obvious way would be to do it is to look at resource utilization and try and then go down by chart check. The problem is the frequency of repeat from high utilizer one year to the next year is less than 20%, less than one in five. The single items don't work. ADLs actually are a big help, but when's the last time you saw ADLs in a uh, medical record? Uh, psychiatric disease is a predictor. But all in all, simple resource utilization doesn't work. One of the things that we used at Kaiser is the EMR to try and look for people who were especially uh, category three. Category four was considered to be the people who were for a straight palliative or, and or hospice approach. And the other thing is that there are authenticated case mix index, Charleston, Alex Hauser, et cetera. There are a number of different uh, types of approaches which could be used. And you can normalize out to roughly how much this person, how many hospital days they should be having in a given year, how, many, how much they should be costing, and start to find out the outliers, and then start looking in a chart check fashion to see who the outliers are, what's driving it. Anybody who hasn't taken a look at ePrognosis.com, uh, which is something which could be automated into an EMR, uh, I would suggest it highly. It's, the first thing I did, of course, is I plugged myself in and thought that I had about five days to live, but so far I've outlasted. But it's a nice way of looking. One of the essences of es evidence-based medicine is when you do an intervention, it should be expected to have a benefit within the amount of time that the person can be rationally expected to live. And one of the ways I would not use it is saying to someone, you have two years to live. What I would use it as a way of telling yourself how much appropriate it is to do curative interventions and how appropriate it is to do palliative interventions. What is my time to benefit? Okay. So to go back to uh, multidisciplinary, the essence of a, I mean, the term many people use, and actually I think it was grossly misused in the last issue of JAGS, um, the way in which most people use uh, geriatric syndrome is that it is something where, let's take dizziness. There are three, three things uh, which are keeping me standing right now, now that I'm not leaning against the, the uh, stand. Uh, there are three things that are keeping me standing right now. Number one is vision, looking at the horizon. Number two is the vestibular system. And number three is proprioception. All these keep me standing. If there's a little bit of diabetic neuropathy, a little bit of glaucoma, and some uh, senile vestibular dysfunction, then all of a sudden I feel dizzy and I start falling over. Uh, it is, the thing to remember is it is the exact opposite of Occam's razor. Uh, it was born after... I believe the Second World War, Second World War, First World War. Uh, in England, which had a great number of wounded people, looking at who would benefit from rehab and who would not benefit from rehab. So when we look at chronic illness, one should always remember the barber rule. And the barber rule is never ask a barber if you need a haircut. Uh, we're geriatricians. We answer everything with a multidisciplinary approach. Um, it's one of the reasons to go to multidisciplinary, as I mentioned earlier, is that when we examine to see if people are just getting bad advice, by and large they were getting good advice. Another thing is to remember is if you have someone who's admitted to the hospital with an acute MI, I'll stop talking about pneumonia so much, uh, if you get admitted to the hospital with acute MI, the reason for admission to the hospital in many cases doesn't change. Certainly we've all seen complications. But by and large, it's one straight threat. However, uh, with chronic illness going over, God willing, years, the needs will change. Noncompliance is a syndrome. It has etiologies. And oftentimes, doctors are poorly, poorly suited to figure out what the etiology of the noncompliance is. Uh, enlisting the family, having people who can enlist the family, having people who can visit the patient multiple times in multiple different reasons. I, caregiver stress. 
and a light bulb joke. Come on, someone's got to laugh. Yeah, I think I have to read it first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rather proud of Angel's light discussion. That's, that's, that was fun. I was actually I was walking to show on Saturday and. Uh, all of a sudden, end of life discussion popped into my head when I was thinking about light bulb jokes. And I'm sitting here, I can't write it down. I have to remember this. I have no short term memory. <laughs> okay, what type of things have been done? And there are many, many different interventions. This is just going to be some. Steve Council's Grace intervention, uh, unselected prospective low income elderly, uh, in that it has a number of dueling statistics. These are complex populations and oftentimes not good statistics. And one of the things that should be noted is I am not saying that the answer is necessarily a multidisciplinary intervention. Uh, I, do not, this is, I do not have proof like lytics for a stroke or anything like that. Um, but this is one of the ways, this is the way which I think is going to be successful, but it still requires validation. I, and one of the things which Dr. Council did in his group in Indiana is lowered the hospital utilization uh, in the highest risk group. Um, does anyone know the single best way to lower uh, hospital readmission? Control the amount of uh, admissions through the ER. Is if you have an ER which admits 50% of the people, it's going to admit 50% of the people who come back in. If it does. 12%, then it's going to be 12%. Um, that's the dirty little secret of readmission in an organization. Uh, there's a group in Florida, Capital Health. Uh, notice the uh, size of the panel. And it consists of an FTE geriatrician, an FTE MA, and two nurses. Uh, in some ways influenced by Mike Rich's congestive heart failure trial. Despite the cost of personnel, and a small amount of people. Uh, they had a well-selected group and were able to show a decrease of, a total decrease of $805 and uh, while maintaining patient satisfaction. There's a very easy way to limit patient resource utilization, which is not give anybody any resources. Uh, this is one of the reasons, anytime you read a study like this, the patient experience, patient satisfaction is a very, very, hard to define, but a very, very important statistic. Uh, the way to do this is not simply by denial. Um, the on-lock program is a combination of adult daycare and primary and centralized care. We do have a, a PACE program associated with UH. Uh, the results in San Francisco in a very homogenous oriental population were astounding. Um, the results overall has been generalized, has not been as good. However, by centralizing care, remember what we're doing is picking people up in the morning, dropping them back off at home at night, uh, nursing home eligible frail elders, and uh, the results have been successful. We've actually learned a great deal about what to do with people who are frail from this program. In process, University of Chicago has an extensivist program, which I find very interesting. I have not seen numbers from it, but I'm hopeful for it. The idea is to, again, to take a small group of people and apply a great deal of resource. And one of the reasons I tend to think it's interesting, it's the way that I naturally think, is by trying to use EMR and other data to select patients at risk, I, and then apply a great deal of resource to giving them exactly what they need. This doesn't mean I'm right, but this is the way that I tend to think. And apparently the way they tend to think as well. Uh, uh, Caremore Anthem has also gone along these ways. Has anyone noticed how the things being assayed as far as successful roles are changing from slide to slide? Uh, if that doesn't raise a red flag, it should. Uh, as I said, this is, this is not a fully defined system. Uh, 
Uh, this is a project which I headed. Uh, we used a analysis of the EMR to select the people who are highest resource utilizers, as well as having, as well as excluding people with irreversible, what we felt to be was irreversible resource utilization. Generated a control group by people who we invited to join and who declined joining us. Uh, one of the weaknesses of it is we did not have an office component. Uh, the, when there's a limit on the visit density that you can do with an at-home patient, uh, there's a great deal of value to seeing a patient at home, something which I happen to uh, both enjoy and I think find valuable in the care of the patient. But uh, you can see patients much more effectively in the office if you have an office component as well and you can increase your visit density. And it, when I look at successful programs, visit density uh, seems to be a very key aspect to successful interventions. I, we were able to do two things which I think were significant. Uh, we increased patient and family satisfaction with care. There was also a decrease in the, in the usage of higher end resources, and other specialty resources. We were able to handle people at a primary care level, which is what we provided. Uh, not only that, the WHO, I, mean, I don't know how they generated the statistic. Maybe they uh, made it up. Maybe they surveyed what. The WHO says that 75% of people would prefer to die at home rather than in the hospital. Uh, whether it's true or not, it sounds true and it sounds right. And I tend to think, to agree with it. Uh, we actually did achieve that of the people on the panel who died. And one of the aspects of the panel was a very morbid panel in our healthiest turtile. We had an annual death rate of about 10%. Those were the healthy ones. Um, but of the people who did die while on the panel, uh, three quarters of them either died suddenly at home or died on hospice at home. Tom Eads and the VA have set up a very successful home-based primary care intervention. Uh, it is operating at the VA, and I have the name of the person at the VA, and I still haven't had a chance to schedule time with them. Uh, the numbers that they've got are quite impressive. However, there is reality, as long as you believe Google. Uh, if we are to, uh, to take this sort of approach to having a single physician on top of panels of a few hundred, 200, 300 very ill people with extensive support staff, I, we would need to do, just for the people above age 65, 2,300 panels across the United States. This includes places like Montana, where driving from one house to another is likely to be five or six hours. Uh, this is something why, although I like this approach, I don't think that this is going to be the only approach or the, and may not be the definitive approach. And certainly within Cleveland or within a city, uh, that does become possible. Arthur Garson started something which I find fascinating, which is exactly the opposite of the way that I think. Uh, and that basically takes, he calls it the Grand Aids, and actually was sued by Band-Aids. So that's why it now has an E at the end, in the end of it. I am not making this up. <laughs> uh, and although technically an English Grand Aids with an E is the correct way to put it. Uh, basically it takes people who are retirees and gives them a basic training not, not the level of an EMT, not the level of an MA, but danger, you know, danger signs, things like that. Uh, they're trained over two weeks, and they're given a panel of patients, and they drop in and say hi. One of the things that you will see with chronic illness is that most sane patients with chronic illness, about the last place they want to be, is inside a hospital. Uh, think of any of you, if you knew you had a limited amount of time left, would you really want to spend it in the hallways of... UH or Cleveland Clinic or anywhere else. You want to be at home. Uh, and so people can be very resistant to letting uh, doctors know that uh, they are sick. When we uh, dissolved the panel, 
because Kaiser was going out of business. Uh, when we dissolved the panel, we set up a transition for one person I remember with chronic lung disease, uh, CO2 retention, electric wheelchair, very limited ability to do ADLs, IADLs. Actually, IADL. No, she's on the computer. She could do IADL. Uh, we set her up with a pulmonologist who, as soon as he saw her, and she was actually doing well when he saw, him, when he saw her, as soon as he saw her, uh, he sent her immediately to the emergency room. Um, that was not particularly what we wanted to see. I, this is some more of the data on Dr. Garson's program. This is what we were doing with segmentation. I think this is probably too dense. For anybody uh, interested, I'd be glad to give you this, uh, the criteria. What we're trying to do is both set up four segments, uh, two of which are too healthy for extensive intervention, and uh, one of which is not someone to intervene in a high count group. Why are we doing this? Well, the question is, is chronic illness a nosological entity? In other words, is someone who's chronic CHF, is there simply CHF gone on for a long time and if we treat the CHF really well, the chronicity won't matter? Or does the chronic uh, dialysis, the chronic CHF, the chronic pulmonary, uh, the chronic dementia patient all have certain factors in common? Uh, that is very strongly the way that I believe. And so, one of the things you do when you have a big system, I, Kaiser, when I left, had one million people over the age of uh, 65, is you start trying to plumb the EMR for quality parameters. And just to read some of them, because I think the type is very small and I do apologize for reading, uh, has there been a cap palliative care advantage? Has there been documented advanced directives? So even if that says full code, just so long as it's documented, it's been discussed. Uh, documented discussion of goals, that is not Goals is not the same as advanced directives. What gives you quality of life? Uh, check affordability, PharmD. Uh, assess for safety and comfort. Ask if a member wants to be hospitalized. And so we start developing flowcharts like this. What do we want to see? Just like, you could imagine if, if I pop uh, diabetes out there, I don't think anyone would have any problem understanding that, you know, diabetes, one, what's the hemoglobin A1C? Two, did I look at their feet? Three, did someone look at their retina? Things like that. Um, four, they talk to the di a dietitian. Those are, those are the quality parameters. And so we were in process of trying to do this on a system-wide scale. And so finally, to take the last of Dr. Kuhn's uh, uh, sentence, what are the goals? Uh, Georges Congiem actually was one of the, Congiem, I'm sorry, I'm bad at French. If anyone wants to correct me, please do. Uh, the, uh, he's one of the teachers of Foucault, and he <coughs> was also an MD as well. He wrote extensively on what is disease. Uh, he, there's a very inter interesting problem that he proposes, which goes really through everything, which is let's say that you take someone who's 45 years old, a marathon runner, uh, happily married, um, in a good mood, goes to see his doctor, everything's fine. And the next day he's out walking and he dies from a saddle embolus because he has metastatic lymphoma to the everywhere. Um, was he healthy when he saw his doctor? I mean, health and illness are really not particularly easy concepts to define. But if we were going to understand what we're doing as a medical system, they're critical. things to support the idea that frailty and multimorbidity are independent parameters in and of themselves is they have a prognosis, they have risk factors, they have, people tend to have similar goals. Uh, and as far as we know, they are the, they're going to be approached in the same way. Uh, what is going to be critical is this really is going to be something where the patient has to define the goals. Uh, for someone, I mean, we talk about futil futility of care, and as you may guess, my thoughts on futility of care may not agree with uh, what many people would say. On the other hand, if 
you had someone in the unit on a vent who was brain dead by Harvard criteria, and their only child was in France with the Army and was flying back to Cleveland to see their mother, how many people here would say that was futile care and shut everything down? I am hopeful there's a reason why nobody is uh, raising their hand. Um, although, you know, Harvard brain, Harvard brain Dead criteria does not get better. Um, so, these, you know, the elicitation of goals, not just directives, but goals, is going to be critical in that. Now, for all of those, I do have a PhD, but uh, there have been no molecules. Anybody know what this molecule is? Dr. Salata, you need to work on your selection process. <laughs> it's some sort of cytochrome given me by Google. I don't know. Uh, Question five. Question five. Incidentally, you notice the color of the hair on the temple? This is before I came to UH. <laughs> this is after coming to UH. Uh, anybody who doesn't remember what uh, question five is, this is Aricep. Okay. These are the questions we started off with. Okay. Why are there more people with chronic illness now than historically? Oh, come on, people. You don't get to talk. You're in charge. <laughs> okay. Uh, it is a success. It is the success of the system. The better we get, the more this is going to happen, so we better get used to it. Uh, what are some of the differences? How does the definition of successful care differ between acute and chronic disease? Okay. Why a multidisciplinary approach? Actually, I'm very partial to number two. And finally, Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your attention.